two days I've been gone. How are the family? What's been going on? Well, your wife two days ago had a bad fever, and a fierce headache which refused to leave her. Ah. Uh, and Tartu? Tartu? Why, he's round and red, bursting with health and excellently fed. Poor fellow. That night, the mistress was unable to take a single bite at the dinner table. Her headache pain, she said, were simply hellish. Oh, and Tartu? He ate his meal with relish and zealously devoured in her presence a leg of mutton and a brace of pheasants. Poor fellow! No, brother, wait! There's one more matter. You agreed of late that young Valère might have your daughter's hand? Quite so. And set the date, I understand? I did. You've now postponed it, is that true? No doubt. The no longer pleases you? Who knows? Do you mean to go back on your word? I won't say that. Has anything occurred which might entitle you to break your pledge? Perhaps. Why must you hem and haw and hedge? The boy asked me to sound you in this affair. It's been a pleasure. But what shall I tell Valère? Whatever you like. What have you decided? What are your plans? I plan, sir, to be guided by heaven's will. Now come, brother, don't talk rot. You two will interchange your faithful loves like two sweet cherubs or two turtle doves. No harsh words shall be heard, no frown be seen, and he shall make you happy as a queen. And she'll make him a couple. Just wait and see. Wait, language! Oh, he's a man of destiny. He's made for horns. And with the stars of man, your daughter's virtue surely can't withstand. Don't interrupt me further. Why can't you learn that certain things are none of your concern? It's for your own sake that I interfere. Most kind. Now hold your tongue, you hear? Weren't you silly to get so overheated? Didn't you see how badly I was treated? Aren't you a simpleton to have lost your head? Didn't you hear the hateful things he said? Oh, you're both great fools. Her sole desire, my is to be yours in marriage. To that I'll swear. He loves you only, and wants no wife but you, Mariano. That'll stake my life. Then why do you advise me so I cannot see? On such a question, why ask advice of me? Oh, you're impossible! Give me your hand to yours first. But why? And now a hand from you. What are you doing? There. A perfect fit. You suit each other better than you'll admit. I'll come. Don't be so haughty. Give a man a look of kindness, won't you, Maria? Please take this handkerchief before you speak. What? Cover that bosom, girl. The flesh is weak, and unclean thoughts are difficult to control. Such sights as that can undermine the soul. Your soul, it seems, has very poor defenses. And flesh makes quite an impact on your senses. It's strange you're so easily excited. My own desires are not so soon ignited. And if I saw you naked as a beast, not all your hide would tempt me the least. Girl, speak more modestly. Unless you do, I shall be forced to take my leave of you. I count myself your debtor. It was nothing, madam. I long to serve you better. There's a private matter I'm anxious to discuss. I'm glad there's no one here to hinder us. I do am glad. It floods my heart with bliss to find myself alone with you like this. For just this chance I've prayed with all my power, but prayed in vain until this happy hour. <laughs> this won't take long, sir. And I hope you'll be entirely frank and unconstrained with me. Indeed. There's nothing I had rather do than bear my inmost heart and soul to you. <laughs> you can't know how it hurts when someone tries to blacken me in my dear brother's eyes. Oh, oh, the mere thought of such ingratitude plunges my soul into so dark a mood, such horror grips my heart. I gasp for breath and cannot speak and feel myself near death. Oh. You blackguard! Why did I spare you? Why did I not break you into little pieces on the spot? Oh, compose yourself, and, and don't be hurt, dear friend. These scenes, these dreadful quarrels, have got to end. 
Forget this trumped up fears. Your argument is one the rightful heir might well resent. It is a moral burden to inherit such wealth, but give Damis a chance to bear it. And would it not be worse to be accused of swindling than to see that wealth misused? I'm shocked that you allowed Orgon to broach this matter and that you feel no self-reproach. Does true religion teach that lawful heirs may freely be deprived of what is theirs? And if the Lord has told you in your heart that you and young Damis must dwell apart, would it not be the decent thing to be a generous and honorable retreat, rather than let the son of the house be sent for your convenience into banishment? Sir, by that heaven which sees me here distressed, and by whatever else can move your breast, do not employ a father's power, I pray you, to crush my heart and force it to obey you. Nor by your harsh commands oppress me so that I begrudge the duty which I owe. And do not so embitter and enslave me that I shall hate the very life you gave me. If my sweet hopes must perish, if you refuse to give me to the one I've dared to choose, spare me at least, I beg you, I implore, the pain of wedding one whom I abhor. Would it, I wonder, carry weight with you if I could show you that our tale was true? Show me? Yes. Rot. Come, what if I found a way to make you see the facts as plain as day? Nonsense. Ha, do answer me. Don't be absurd. I'm not now asking you to trust our word. Suppose that from some hiding place in here, you learned the whole sad truth by eye and ear. What would you say of your good friend after that? I'd say uh, nothing by Jehoshaphat can be true. You've been too long deceived. Before and now but to comply. If this is sinful, if I'm wrong to do it, so much the worse for him who drove me to it. The fault can surely not be charged to me. Madam, the fault is mine, if fault there be. Open the door a little and peek out. I wouldn't want my husband poking about. Why worry about the man? Each day he grows more gullible. One can lead him by the nose. To find us here would fill him with delight, and if he saw the worst, he'd doubt his sight. I never let a do step out for a minute into the hall and see that no one's in it. Speak clearly, mother. Say what's on your mind. I mean that I can smell a rat, my dear. You know how everybody hates him here. That has no bearing on the case at all. I told you a hundred times when you were small. That virtue in this world is hated ever. Malicious men may die, but malice never. No doubt that's true, but how does it apply? But they've turned you against him by a clever lie. I've told you I was there and saw it done. The tongues of spite are busy night and noon, and to their venom no man is immune. <clears throat> and I'm here, sir, if you'll permit the liberty to serve you with this writ. To what? Now, please, sir, let us have no friction. It's nothing but an order of eviction. Now you're to move your goods and family out and make way for new occupants, without deferment or delay. And give your keys. I leave this house. Why, yes, sir, if you please. This house, sir, from the cellar to the roof, belongs now to the good Monsieur Tartuffe. That scoundrel who's imposed upon you so, denounced you to the king an hour ago, and as supporting evidence displayed the strong box of a said renegade, whose secret paper so testified you had disloyally agreed to hide. I don't know just what charges may be pressed, but there's a warrant out for your arrest. Tartu has been instructed furthermore to guide the arresting officer to your door. He's clearly done this to facilitate his seizure of your house and your estate. That man, I must say, is a vicious beast. But quick, sir, you mustn't tarry in the least. <laughs> 